Hello everyone, my name is, well, that's outdated, my name is uh, Vespasianus Tyrannus, uh, also known as Ver Rusticum, and today we are discussing a very serious topic. Russia, China, and the United States. These are the three major superpowers of our lifetime. And on some occasions, especially when geopolitical situations abroad turn nasty, a dark thought crosses our minds sometimes. What would happen if two of these superpowers engaged in an all-out war? Would it be the end of human civilization as we know it? Would one side ultimately come out on top, even at a high cost? This debate has raged on, particularly since the end of the world at the end of World War II, as many Americans wanted to wage war against the Soviet Union. The protest phrase, better dead, better dead than red, comes to mind. This debate is raging on once again, especially with the recent situation in Ukraine. And the topic tonight is, should the United States invade Russia? With me are two equally brilliant minds, two souls I have my fair share of agreements and disagreements with to debate this subject, Dr. Globe and Net7. Before we get into our opening statements, I want to ask for your introductions, what your political ideology is, whether you're left, right, or center, and where one can find you if you want to be discovered. We're going to start with Dr. Globe for his introduction. Okay. Um, hello, I am Dr. Globe. Um, my, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, although I am currently studying in Putney, Vermont. Um, I have been fascinated in geography ever since fourth grade, and my um, fascination in geography has expanded to also study other cultures, to study other politics and um, whatnot, and that's how I also got into the realm of geopolitics. So here I am today. Um, I, I'm basically here, um, well, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what else to say about my, uh, my, uh, intro, really. Okay, we're gonna go in at seven. Net seven, you're muted. Good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening uh, again. Um, I do appreciate your time. Um, I hope that you'll also go to my uh, Twitch because I'm also uh, streaming this uh, debate via there. Uh, my introduction about me, uh, for those of you who are who don't know much about me, I'm a neoconservative. Um, that means I, I believe in a hawkish foreign policy, um, but I also have conservative values and principles. Uh, such as I'm anti-abortion, um, for low taxation, I uh, believe in the Second Amendment, and I'm for, um, I'm a nationalist, uh, and I'm a Christian. And I'm glad to hear that you all are participating and watching, and I hope to convince you with my arguments. Thank you. All right, cool. All right, so here's the structure of this panel. You both will get 20-minute opening statements you don't have to use all that time, but that's the amount of time I'll give you to uh, clarify your views on the subject. Uh, and you, and after that, we're going to go into a we're going to have a, a discussion. Uh, my only rules for this panel are: uh, do not interrupt each other, no ad hominem attacks or insults, and when I start talking, you must be quiet because I'm trying to moderate. Um, I will be liberal with the mute button. Uh, we're going to who who which of you wants to start first? I'll give the floor to Net7. Sure, I don't know. Uh, you'll time me, correct? Yeah, starting now. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. I do appreciate you uh, uh, listening in to my opinions and to uh, this discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're pressed with a, a terrible crisis um, currently today. There is a serious issue going on in the world, and that is the rise of despots, the rise of tyrants, and the rise of individuals who would like to see essentially other nations bent to their will and enslaved. Uh, Vladimir Putin 
is one of those individuals, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, his actions in Georgia, his actions in the Ukraine, his actions in Syria, his attempted um, coercion of the Baltic states, you know, continue to show that Vladimir Putin is not a friend of the West. He is not a friend of freedom and he is not a friend uh, to the free world. This debate, ladies and gentlemen, is how do we stop an individual um, who is such a uh, tyrannical despot? How do we stop this murderer who kills off his opponents uh, through getting the FSB, essentially the modern KGB, to go off and essentially assassinate people for him through uh, giving individuals who have been critical of him tea that is, that is radioactive. Um, he has killed people with this method. Um, seems to be his favorite method. Um, he has uh, aided and abetted despots and tyrants in Syria, such as Bashar the Butcher, um, Bashar al-Assad. Um, he has cooperated with and worked with despotic regimes before, uh, particularly also in Iran. Uh, with Xi Jinping, and uh, even with North Korea. This debate is on whether how we stop this tyrant. Um, the other side will advocate for a more defensive posture. We should uh, essentially let him make the first move and then wait and see. Uh, and that, But ladies and gentlemen, I feel this is a flawed policy. Obviously, we don't want to start this war um, prematurely, but if Vladimir Putin forces this war on us and forces the war in the West, upon the free world, upon NATO, upon our allies, and upon ourselves, then, then the strategy is then, well, how do we counter that? Do we simply sit back and watch and wait while he occupies the whole of Ukraine or try to mount some defense in Ukraine, but allow him one front where he will be able to amass all his forces in one fell swoop and strike? Granted, some have argued that Vladimir Putin's mil Russian military might is that of a paper tiger, but even a paper, but even uh, a paper tiger, when massing all their forces in one small area, can take the advantage if they can act swiftly and quickly enough, and decisively enough, and and strike with all their might and power. And I have, ar and I am arguing, ladies and gentlemen, that the best way to defeat Vladimir Putin, if he should engage in a, in a war in the Ukraine and attempt to occupy uh, the nation, that we should have an interventionist stand, which is to then do a counter strike into Russia, into the Russian heartland. There are areas that we can do this. The United States uh, through Alaska could go into the east of Russia, into Kamchatka. We could certainly with our assets in Japan and South Korea, uh, attack or hit Vladivostov, and in the Baltic states with our allies, uh, we could certainly move in uh, towards St. Petersburg. And if we could get the Finns in, who are actually looking to get, uh, looking to actually get into NATO, because they see the aggression of the Russian state towards the Ukraine, and now see that they might be next in the chopping block, we could certainly then move in to take other portions of the more rural and isolated Russia, but also isolate St. Petersburg. Ladies and gentlemen, the best way to fight a war is not to be on the defensive all the time. A person who is on the defensive all the time allows their enemy to take advantage of their lack of willingness to move. They then decide where they can strike, and they will strike, ladies and gentlemen, where they feel that they have the advantage. Particularly when an enemy has no threat um, of seeing any other part of their territory or their uh, sphere of control attacked, it gives them the comfortability to put all their assets into one localized area to use them to maximize their effect. Ladies and gentlemen, this is this is why we have such a terrible status quo antebellum in Korea. Granted, it's a good, a decent status quo because it at least allows us to keep the North Koreans back in the South free. We know that because the North Koreans don't have to worry about any other borders except what's to their south, they can throw all their forces in one area and use them to maximum effect. This is the same situation that we're facing right now in Ukraine. 
Thankfully, we don't have that situation if we're willing to do what is necessary, which is to go beyond simply fighting in Ukraine, if that's what Vladimir Putin does, but also to attack other areas, particularly areas bordering the Baltic states, um, areas involving Eastern Russia. But let's not forget too that the Russian state has territory that is literally uh, close to Poland and is completely isolated. You know, a border with our NATO allies and friends. Um, if the Rush, if the Russian state were to attack under Vladimir Putin, should we simply just ignore that territory that is literally right next to um, our Baltic state allies and friends, um, where the, the the essentially the uh, Russian state Vladimir Putin could use that area to essentially uh, be an area where he could put in assets that would be used um, covertly to try and undermine the alliance should he attack? Or could we take this very westernmost territory and use it as a bargaining chip to force Vladimir Putin to the table and to ensure uh, peace in the region? Ladies and gentlemen, we appeasement, this, the time for following by the rules of engagement by our enemies is over. The, the, we have tried to appease Vladimir Putin and it has not worked. We have tried to do negotiations, and it's, it has not worked. If Vladimir Putin engages in an aggressive war in with our friends in the Ukraine, who whose only crime was looking into NATO membership, then we must defend them, and we must be willing to use the tools and strategies that we have to attack our enemy, and not simply fight the game as they wish. I look forward to uh, my opponent's argument and their questions. I look forward to your questions, and I hope to convince you all uh, with the the right right argument of my side. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to Dr. Globe for his twenty minute opening statement. Okay, um, it is not appeasement to defend Ukraine, especially if we do it with the greatest effort possible. And we can defend Ukraine on one front. Um, yes, I, I, I can see your point. You don't think that um, all war should be defensive, but when it comes to Ukraine, absolutely it should. Re remember that Russia has the most nuclear bombs in the world. Um, Russia has a lot of um, missile interception systems that would, um, um, that would, that would block um, many of our uh, planes and weapons, you know, stuff. We would have um, Russia's geography, um, especially invading from uh, Siberia, of all, of all places, is absolutely, um, how would I say it, unrealistic. Um, I don't think it can happen. Make, like... Um, even if they didn't send in any nukes, it would take forever for us to walk, walk across Liberia. It would pretty much buy Russia time just to do whatever they're doing in Ukraine. And maybe while we're actually distracted there, you know, China can go invade Taiwan if they want. Like, um, so basically my opening statement is pretty much this, is that, um, this is this this topic is literally about um, this conversation we've had before um, about whether we should invade um, Russia from the Siberian front. Um, it's just um, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, sorry, I've I, I've been I've been reading some. Okay, um, okay. Sorry, where was I? You were you were about to finish your opening statement, it seemed. Yeah, I guess I'll just kind of end it there. Yeah, that was much quicker than I thought. Okay, so here's how we're going to continue this. So you two are going to speak dialectically. So, Dr. Globe, since you're the challenger, you're going to be able to ask Net7 five questions, and you have the ability to respond to improper uh, and you, there can be back and forth for every question. 
And similarly, after those five questions are up, after you ask your five questions, Net7 will be able to ask you five questions and you can answer, have a back and forth. Um, and I would only intervene if things are getting chaotic or you're interrupting each other. And so basically, um, yep, you're going to speak dialectically. Um, and if you guys want more questions, if you want to be allowed more questions so we can continue this, uh, that's fine. But I want this to be about roughly an hour or actually, no, I think we can go on for uh, like 60 to 70 minutes. I guess it will depend on when this naturally ends, I guess. So, uh, yep, Dr. Globe, you can ask your, your, your first question. Okay. Um, so what exactly is your, what is your standard of, appe of appeasement? Because when people think of appeasement in the context of Ukraine, it's certainly not the fact that, um, we, it's, it's certainly not the idea that we send like 100,000 troops into Ukraine and be able to have the will to fight the Russian army. No, it's, it, this is the far lower standard. What, what we were doing, okay, all we did was give some aid to Ukraine when they when um, when they invaded Crimea and the Donbass region. Um, all we ever did was kind of condemn it and have a UN Security Council resolution. Like we didn't do shit. That's what appeasement is. Appeasement is not um, defending Ukraine militarily with our troops on the ground. Um, that would actually be far more effective. And yes, Putin would definitely run for the hills in that regard. So that's definitely my first question. Um, how in the absolute fucking world, sorry, is defending Ukraine with our own troops appeasement? Well, I answer the question. So the, the, the what appeasement is, from my definition, is what you've asked is essentially in giving in to your opponent, in this case, Vladimir Putin, conceding to them and not be, and essentially giving them what they want. The America, while there are troops in Ukraine, as you have such as you as you have correctly stated, those troops have been uh, very small, they have been minor, and they have been told that they are not that they are to have simply a defensive posture. In fact, recently, um, some U U.S. troops that were actually in the country, um, that were in Ukraine, have actually been pulled out of the country because the Biden administration is afraid, in my opinion, that if those troops are attacked and have to defend themselves, um, this will escalate, uh, you know, American involvement. And so Biden is doing, President Biden is doing everything he can to minimize involvement um, while at the same time giving the appearance that he's helping. Because ever since the debacle of the Afghan withdrawal and how awfully it was handled, and I would argue that we never even should have done it, um, the fact of the matter is is that this was a foreign policy embarrassment to Biden. He, looked, he was humiliated on the international stage. Um, even his own VP um, literally hid away and was literally almost never seen during this because it was so awful to the point where she even she's even been said, quoted as stating in private they're not going to pin this shit on me because of how embarrassed because of how embarrassingly humiliating it was in fact there have even been calls from uh the republican um uh, members of the house uh to actually impeach biden over just how embarrassing of a debacle that the withdrawal was and so when i look at what's going on in ukraine I see that the president is essentially giving into an appeasement strategy, which is to give the illusion to our NATO allies and friends that he's doing something um, and trying to essentially bluff Vladimir Putin. And I don't, and I agree with John Bolton when he went on CNN recently and just said that Vladimir Putin has no reason to believe anything that Biden is going to say about defending Ukraine. Um, and but at the same time, and at the same time, try, like I said, try to bluff Vladimir Putin into thinking that the Americans might do something. But uh, the the policy has already been stated that Ukraine is essentially on its own, and you NATO and NATO will obviously um, look to defend Ukraine. I hope, but the NATO is very much, um, you know, influenced by American decisions. Look what happened in Afghanistan. NATO could have held the line in Afghanistan 
It has numerous member states that could have kept troops in Afghanistan, but they followed America's lead. And in the same case, the same might happen in Ukraine. And if and that's why I consider what's going on a, an appeasement strategy, because it's doing the bare minimum, and in, some, in my opinion, not even the bare minimum, but just giving the illusion of doing something rather than actually doing something concrete. So th that's my answer to your question. Um, I kind of agree with everything you say for the most part. Um, what I do not think Biden's doing a good job on Ukraine either. I also think Afghanistan was an absolute embarrassment, and I've actually I think I've called for impeachment for him for that. And I say that as a Democrat myself. Um, the, but like, here's here's the problem though. Um, yes, it would like I would say that even Germany is kind of like this as well with Olaf Scholz. He's even like pressuring um ukraine to uh, i'll get on to my second question just uh, this this will lead up so he's he is pressuring um he's pr trying to pressure ukraine um to federalize and give uh, autonomy to the luhansk and donetsk regions um very familiar with how you know when britain and france um pressured czechoslovakia to um see the sudeten land to uh Germany, right? So um, yes, I see appeasement in that. Um, I, I really do. And I actually agree with you on that. But here's the problem I have here. And here's what I'm going to ask. All right. Um, why is there no, um, wh why is there only two extremes where you have to be weak like Biden or you invade Siberia? And you, you understand that those are, those are two extremes, right? No, I don't. And um, I think that it's debatable on whether I'm looking to go, whether, um, you know, as far as into Siberia, um, the territories that I've been considering for have been the Primorsky uh, Krai area, which is the region which contains the uh, city of Vladivostok, which is the um, largest city in the eastern part of Russia. And it's um, the administrative center of the region I just mentioned. Um, I also mentioned uh, Kamchatka Peninsula, um, which is, um, you know, for you, for the viewers out there, the most eastern part of um, the region. And Sorry. Yeah, new rule. Uh, mute your phone before you join the stream. Anyway, go on, Net7. And, uh, okay, uh, and uh, Kamchatka which is um, the most eastern part of Russia, which is very close to the state of Alaska um, and still close enough also to Japan, where the United States could use its assets in this far eastern region to bring Vladimir Putin um, back to the negotiation no, negotiating table. Um, also, I have mentioned uh, the territory of uh, Kaliningrad Oblast, which borders several different member, members, uh, Poland in particular, and our Baltic state allies. Um, taking these regions that I have discussed with you, um, was not going all the way into the heart of Siberia, um, would be areas in which the United States uh, and which our NATO allies could take and could then use to force Vladimir Putin back to the negotiating table and make it clear to him that, and also make it clear to him that the United States and NATO response is will not simply just be to uh, wait and see and just wait for the next incoming attack. And also it would force at the same time Vladimir Putin to take assets that normally he would be able to send into the uh, Ukraine if there was only one front that he had to fight on, and instead had to take those forces and put them into other areas. I also mentioned in my opening statement, too, that um, Finland is looking at... Finland um, has been making overtures since... They und and you can and for the, those of you viewers out there, you can look this up yourself. I mean, just do a simple search on binge uh, or, or Bing, you know, however you pronounce it. I pronounce it binge. Um, I get, but um, you, Finland has been looking to get into NATO, 
uh, you know, and the thing, sorry, Finland is a native, sorry, Finland is a native, it's one of its most active partners. And the fact of the matter is, is that they've been purchasing a lot of equipment uh, from our, from us. Uh, well, sorry, no, Finland, sorry. Finland and Sweden right now are looking to um, get involved into, you know, what's going on here in the Ukraine. And the fact of the matter is, is this, is that the, the, that Finland has a big war also with Russia. Um, now, sorry, so Finland right now um, is reluctant, is, is, is sort of, um, is, is sort of reluctant to join NATO, even though it's a partner. So I, I mistakenly said it was in NATO. Sorry, it's actually more of a partner really than, a, than an actual member. But the fact of the matter is, is that even th that Finland right now, and this is from the Republic World News, um, only six, only f about 60% of the nation um, in polls actually want to join NATO. And so we would then, if they were to join, or at the very least be a part of this al military alliance, then there would be plenty of territory also along Finland's border that we could use, you know, particularly St. Petersburg. So imagine if we took Vladivostok, took St. Petersburg, uh, took uh, Kaliningrad Oblast, and uh, took um, Kachatka, we would then be in a situation where we could force Vladimir Putin back to the table and save Ukraine from disaster. Okay. Um, I think I just want to ask again, because I feel like um, I haven't really clarified what I meant. Um, not just talking about invading Siberia specifically. Why is there only two extremes where either we appease and let Russia take Crimea and the rest of Ukraine, or we fucking invade Russia from two fronts. Why is your, there- Does that count as your third question, Dr. Globe? I apologize for interrupting, but do you count that as your third question, or are you trying to restate your second question? I, want, I definitely want to restate it. Okay. Um, I, th I think I've answered it though succinctly, um, because what has been i think i answered the question succinctly because the fact of the matter is is that dr globe is i i think is trying to suggest that there's a third strategy which is to put u.s troops um more aggressively in the ukraine put sanctions on russia but i have not suggested but i have no i but i, th I again that strategy just won't work in my opinion, because if you go with that strategy, one, it allows Vladimir Putin and the Russian military to dictate the terms of the fight, to attack where they're strong, um, evade where they're weak, and then potentially, unless, and with, with how few assets there are in Ukraine from the United States, you know, Vladimir Putin might just take, Vladimir Putin, if he if he were to be successful, he might be able to take all of Eastern Ukraine before the United States can actually have a, have a response that Dr. Globe would want, and by that time it might be too late. That's why I'm I'm arguing for escalating by taking Kaliningrad Oblast, by taking the Kamchatka Peninsula, um, by taking. Um, Vladivostok and Primorsky Cry, if possible, which is the the whole that whole region, um, because it then gives more leverage for the United States and for NATO to get Vladimir Putin to stop being aggressive. Okay. Um, okay. Next question. So. Um, how do you know that this wouldn't be a very prolonged war, um, assuming there are no nuclear bombs in the mix, which I think we would, I will probably address later. But I'll just, I'll just go with your assumption that there will be no, no nuclear bombs, all right? So there will be no nuclear bombs. Um, how do you, because um, still even in that regard, all right, a war with Russia would not just last two weeks or three weeks. It would, it would last a pretty long time, all right? And so... How can you make sure 
that countries that are not involved in this fight, let, let's say China, um, take advantage of us, of both of us being distracted, literally, you know, launching missiles at each other, um, launching uh, Russia's launching missiles at our allies. Uh, we're just completely weakening each other. And then China, meanwhile, can, you know, quietly just take Taiwan. Um, they can just quietly may maybe take more territory and allow themselves to grow. Well, we're fucking, you know, um, how would I say it? Um, punching, punching each other and hurting each other horribly. How do you know that that will not basically just be free real estate for China? Well, the, the, I do know this. That if the United States continues its current path, which is what the Biden administration is doing, the, the, the CCP will look at that and will say, wow, the United States left Afghanistan, let the Taliban take over and did nothing about it and did nothing to try to stop the Taliban from taking over. They didn't even send in the Air Force to try and bomb the Taliban to give the, the Afghan army space and time to regroup i mean and then just let them and just let them walk in and take kabul without even a fight and if they see this and what they're looking in right now in ukraine is giving them more of an incentive to actually act aggressively because they're saying wait a minute now the united states under uh, uh under president biden uh biden resign hashtag is going to then incentivize them to act more aggressively in Taiwan and in the uh, South China Sea, because then they will see, wow, the United States is what is it's literally falling over like a wet blanket. What what incentive do we have to take Taiwan or put more pressure Taiwan? It only increase that only increases for them if we have a the same strategy that the Biden administration is proposing. And the strategy which you are proposing, which is to put more troops in Ukraine, but to adopt a defensive posture, would only, in my mind, increase the length of the war. Because Biden and Putin then can put all his assets into one area and potentially take eastern Ukraine. And then if we then start putting assets and Vladimir Putin is unable to take Kiev, then that will then create a long drawn out war in which we are fighting in Ukraine's territory where neither side where either side is not is essentially going back to fighting um, a, a drawn out war in which both sides don't have an advantage because they both have all their military assets in one area. Uh, one is technologically superior, that's us, uh, but the other has more numbers than. And that's why my strategy would be better because it would then tell the CCP that America is willing to fight for its friends and its allies. Um, we better put our, our plans of potential invasion on hold and let's stick back to trying to use coercive dip diplomacy and um, coercive trading practices to get an advantage over Taiwan. Okay, um, so I have one more question. God, I don't know, know what question I'm on. Oh, uh, how many questions did you ask so far? I didn't keep count. You've asked, I think, four. I think this is your fifth. Um, I think you restated your your third. Okay. No, All no, right, no. You so restated your second. You restated your second. And I was wondering if that counted as your third. So this is your fourth question, but he said it's your final. If you don't want a fifth question, then that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking, I feel like, um, okay. Um, so how do you, um, do you, do you ever think about the fact that if we have NATO and the United States pit against Russia and actually invade Russia, even if there's no nuclear bombs, right? Um, Russia will still use very destructive weapons, um, not just against Ukraine. Um, they'll probably use it against Poland. 
They'll use it against the United Kingdom. They'll probably use it against France, Italy, um, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Um, maybe thousands or tens of thousands of civilians could die, possibly more civilians than would actually die, even in a successful invasion of Ukraine, even in a successful, like the worst case scenario in Ukraine, to have such a large scale war like that. Um, how can you make sh like what what exactly are we preventing if this sort of war that you are proposing would actually cause a worse humanitarian crisis than the worst case scenario in Ukraine? Well, because, because Putin will not use nukes, that's why. The idea that Vladimir Putin would hold use on, I, I don't want to interrupt. I, don't, I hate to interrupt, but like I but like there are other weapons other than nuclear bombs. Well, your question insinuates the the nuclear option, so that's why I'm addressing that. Vladimir Putin will not use nuclear weapons in a fight in Ukraine. He knows that that would be suicide. Um, he's he, the, everyone knows that. The fact of the matter is, is that once nukes get are used. All options are off. All bets are off. And no state, no no state actor, even one like Vladimir Putin, is going to make that risk. Uh, and the the fact of the matter is, is that we know we knew, we know we know that Vladimir Putin has nukes. And we know that Xi Jinping has nukes. We know that these enemies, the geopolitical of the United States, have nukes. But we tolerate them because we at least know that as evil as they are and as mad and as despotic as they are, the idea that they would launch a nuke in a war setting, they know would be suicide because they know the United States' assets, nuclear assets, could wipe them off the face of the earth. That's why we have more aggressive feelings towards North Korea getting nukes because we know that he's so mad he might he actually might do it. This is different from Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin doesn't want to doesn't want to rule over a nation of ashes, and a nation that he, and in an and in an attack that he might not himself survive. He will not take that risk. A war in which we go to war in with uh, against Russia, against the Kremlin, and I don't like to, I sh and I don't even like to use the term Russia because. The Russian people do not represent Vladimir Putin. I prefer to call it, you know, the Kremlin. There, the Kremlin essentially holds the Russian people hostage to their will. Um, in, a, in, a, in a nation where um, so many people are poor and needy, in which you know many Russian many Russians try to leave the country just of how because of how bad it is economically. Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin knows that once he uses the nuclear option. All bets are off. The United States will destroy him and obliterate him, and he will have nothing if even he survives, which I, which he might not even survive. So I don't see the nuclear option coming in. We've all learned from the Cold War that when two states, super states, pointed nukes at each other, neither side wanted to be the first one to go with that option because they knew what would happen. And eventually, thankfully, you know, the United States won and the Soviet Union fell. But Vladimir Putin is trying to bring back a, a newer, a different version of the Soviet Union, one with its old territory, but just under his uh, klepto kleptocracy. And so I do not, I dismiss the idea that nukes would ever be put into the option because tyrants like, and despots like Vladimir Putin don't want to rule over ashes and they don't want to potentially die because they know that if nukes are used, they would rule over nothing. And not only that, they might themselves not survive the aftermath. All right. So this is, this is one more question for me or. Yeah. Which, you which have one case? more question and then next seven, we'll get to ask. Okay, okay. One more question. So I guess I'll just do a follow up question with each one. Um, are you sure that you aren't being overconfident about the idea that 
Russia will not use nuclear bombs against us, especially if we take economic centers like St. Petersburg. Because you understand that um, Putin would probably go down either way, even if Russia surrenders. Like, Russia, like Vladimir Putin once said, like, there's no happiness in life. He's already kind of like, you know, he would probably have a low self-esteem if he's not in power. So how would you know that he would not want to bring the world down with him if he was going to fall? Because obviously, um, if Russia lost this war and so many people died from our invasion, um, there would be a very, he would be very unpopular at that point, and he would probably be deposed at that point, and he would probably face trial, maybe even death, right? Um, there's many others, like, it's, I don't, like, it's not like he would survive, he surrendered. Um, because like literally his prize, the fact that he's the president of Russia, he would lose all of his pride if he was toppled and as a country got invaded. Um, there's a definitely a chance that he would be willing to take the world down with him. And he might be thinking the same way. What if, if I launch nukes, would the United States be willing to launch nukes back? Because, you know, in a nuclear war between the United States and Russia, I mean, it's, it's mutually assured destruction. It's only a matter of like which one is willing to go the furthest. And um, there's also another scenario. Let's say that Vladimir Putin doesn't use any nukes. How do you know that the Russian army will be like, okay, Vladimir Putin is being a coward, so we're going to take this matter into our own hands? Because definitely military rule could also be another thing that could happen, and they'll take it into their own hands, and they'll make, they could use nuclear bombs. How do you know that there's not a, like, many in many ways, Russia could definitely be using nukes? And this is something that you are risking, and something that would be, be far worse than... Ukraine even getting annexed. Well, I think that you've sort of revealed your argument at the end, at the at, with the end right there, that Ukraine is um, essentially okay. To, it's okay to essentially make the Ukrainian people, millions of them, uh, the sacrificial lambs uh, to the Russian state out of the complete non uh, out of the fear. That, well, if what happens if things go nuclear, in which we know that Vladimir Putin would not make that effort, uh, you assume that Vladimir Putin is is on the madness level of Kim Jong Un. He's not, and if we were to take centers like Vladivostok or Saint Petersburg um, and uh, Kaliningrad, that would force Vladimir Putin to back off, and. I think what you're assuming is you're and you're accusing me of assuming something that I that, that of assuming something and not taking into account the risks. But there is a level of common sense that has to be put into this argument. Does Vladimir Putin have the madness level of Kim Jong Un? And the answer is no. Would would Vladimir Putin use nukes if he saw he was losing? Um, just to rule over the ashes and and potentially not survive himself. No, despots like Vladimir Putin want to survive and they want to live. They don't. They're not on the level of Kim Jong Un, where they don't care if the whole world birds around them. Uh, they they just want. They don't care if there's only ashes left. They're fine with that. Vladimir Putin is not the same. And I think what she assumes, unfortunately, is that if we don't inter, if we just play defense in Ukraine and beat back the Russian attacks, um, then the people in Russia who are showing, who are a mix of Putin diehards and a mix of people who are just disaffected because of the dire economic straits of the country, um, that those people then would rise up and would depose Vladimir Putin and not have to do it for us. The problem is, is that History shows us this is not always the case. Um, we saw, for example, in the first Gulf War, in uh, the first Iraq War, in which we, depo we defeated the United States and our Arab coalition allies, drove back Saddam Hussein uh, from Kuwait in one of the most um, decisive victories uh, in history, in which was actually nicknamed the Highway of Death, because the Iraqi army that had occupied Kuwait had been so obliterated and crushed that it was, it was, we thought that there was no way that because of this disastrous defeat that Saddam Hussein would last. We felt that we didn't need to go into Iraq and that Saddam Hussein would just be deposed by the people because of this humiliating, embarrassing defeat. They would be able to take advantage of the fact that he had lost so many troops in uh, 
you know, in the highway of death, but that's not what happened. Um, when the United States showed that it was not willing to take to go into Iraq and seize Baghdad and liberate the people, um, Saddam Hussein took note of that. And I would not say that that's, and I would say that's not really Bush's fault. That was more the Democrats who pressured George Bush not to go into Iraq. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that Saddam Hussein rallied uh, his loyalists and the Republican Guard, um, stamped out those who rose up against him, and then and took took control of the country. And granted, Iraq could no longer wage an offensive war because of that disastrous defeat. Um, Saddam Hussein still remained in power and still uh, continued to abuse his people and support terrorist groups across the Middle East until he was finally deposed. And so without taking centers like St. Petersburg, without taking centers like Vladivostok, and without taking centers like uh, Kaliningrad, there would be no Ability, there would be no real incentive, I think, for the people of Russia to really rebel n without having a chance of victory, because they would. Th because Vladimir Putin, if he were to be kicked out of Ukraine, would then simply take his military assets, knowing that no one's going to stop him, and no one's going to intervene, and just stamp out these regions and reassert his control. Granted, he may never be again able to wage an offensive war. But he will still remain in power, and the people of Russia will be st will still suffer, and the people of Ukraine will still, and the Baltic states will still have to be wary on their eastern borders. So that's my answer to your question. All right, Net Seven. Now it is your turn. You get to ask Doctor Globe five questions. You'll have back and forths and whatnot. So Net Seven, you can pose your first question to Doctor Globe. Uh, thank you. Uh, So, um, Dr. Globe, I have a question. My question, my first question for you is this. Is Biden's strategy in Ukraine going to work and can it work? And what, and if you believe this, what evidence do you have that suggests that the minimum effort applied can deter Vladimir Putin? Okay. So, I will say that Biden is not doing a good job. I think he's doing just little enough that Russia might have some wiggle room for some confidence that they will be able to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, but I do think the fact that even if Biden's bluffing or whatnot, I feel like it does make Russia a little bit more hesitant to invade Ukraine in that regard. Um, because um, Ukraine is already, um, Ukraine's military, the armed forces of Ukraine, um, are more beefed up than they were back in 2014, and even in 2014. Um, hold up. Um, e even in 2014, um, Russia did not even get as much. Let's just let me just let me fit. Okay, so even after 2014, uh, e even during 2014. Um, Russia, when Russia invaded on its own and nobody came to their aid, they did not even get all of the territory they hoped to get. They, they wanted to get as far as Odessa Oblast, near the Moldovan border, um, far, far further than they get from, uh, let's say, Donetsk. Um, they only got as far as half of Donetsk Oblast. And um, so the reason why I raise this point is because um, now that Ukraine's military is, even, is, now, is now more powerful, plus with a slight chance the United States could come to their aid that makes Russia a little bit more hesitant. However, however, I don't think he's doing a good job. And I think, I think like he still hasn't, I think he has the door open enough that Russia can still like have enough confidence to go invade Ukraine. So I would say it probably won't work, but if we're lucky, it could. Um, okay, so before we continue this uh, this conversation, we're going to go on a one-minute break so you guys can use the restroom, you can get some water, you can refresh your memory, get some fresh air. So we'll be back in exactly one minute.
All right, are you all back? Okay, all right, so yeah, uh, I think everyone's returned. I'm back, yes, right. sorry. It's all right, so here, so um, here's what Did we're going to do. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> response? Uh, yeah, uh, I, you were not done with your response. Yeah, did you hear my response? I was just yeah, sure yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. All right, and seven, you can go on to your uh, second question now. Unless you want to respond to his response. Uh, no, I think we. I think I'll save that for the back and forth because I think I think that I want to stick with your format. You know, the questions, response, and then another question, then the response, and then later, that's when we go back and forth. Yeah, we After can have a we we can have like a we can have a we can have a back and forth before the Q and A and closing statements. So, yeah, uh, continue asking your questions, uh, Nat. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Globe, my second question for you is this. Without tanking on um, a region like Kaliningrad, and which NATO could take and overwhelm uh, because it is surrounded by um, either NATO members or allies, what, uh, what incentive uh, does Vladimir Putin have in coming to the negotiation table without the risk of actual Russian territory being seized. Because we, if we could take life, if we could take um, its region of Primorsky Krai, if we could take the Kamchatka Peninsula, and we could take Kaliningrad, do you not concede that Vladimir Putin would be forced to come to the negotiation table sooner rather than later. Um, I absolutely do not think he would um, end the. I don't. I don't think he'll surrender after Primorsky and Kaliningrad were taken. Um, I think he would definitely um, try to actually instill more morale to the Russian army. Uh, this he tried to frame this as the fight of the century. Um, this like this this might could be something that he's been waiting for like. We don't really know because there's not really a precedent we have for we have with this. We don't have a really have a precedent where you know Russia has gone against a war with NATO. Um, we all know that Vladimir Putin is definitely a greedy fuck who only cares about himself. But um, we haven't seen him with the, we haven't seen him what it's like when they invade Russia. Um, we, we don't know what would happen. We don't know how Russia would respond if we invaded them. And that and with that, we are taking a huge risk. Thank you. My third question is this, and I, I obviously disagree with your answer, but my, my third question to you is this. If we fight solely a defensive war in the Ukraine, do you not concede that Vladimir Putin will be able to dictate the terms and the fight that such a war would be? Um, well, yeah, well, usually when you launch an offensive, like, you will have the initial high ground. Um, and I actually support something that Ukraine is doing right now. They're actually launching um, offensive against the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic, showing to Russia that they mean business. Um, they're showing that they're not scared of Russia. So they've already started launching, you know, offensives against Russian proxies. And I think that's probably um, helped to actually, um, how would I say it, um, to actually uh, delay um, the Russian invasion. Because um, I feel like they have to keep looking more at the planning table. They have to keep sorting things out, you know, to figure out like what, like, what will be the pros and cons of this, pros and cons of that. Like, um, they have this, um, they definitely have this strategy where they just keep Russia thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking, you know, just prolonging, you know, it just pro just prolonging, um, this, you know, this cold war stance. And, um, I don't really buy that it would really be dictated on Putin's terms because let's say that on top of, we just kick Russia out of Ukraine. We also take Crimea back. Well, that means Russia's already back at square one, um, where they used to be all the way back in uh, 2014, 
And I don't think it's like, it'll be a horrible thing, you know, if, um, if we just kind of did that and only did from one front, because also remember that Russia, Vladimir Putin is not going to also going to be the president of Russia forever. Um, there's only so many wars that Putin's going to be willing to go into. Um, trying to invade Ukraine for a third time after losing against Ukraine, um, Ukraine alone, and then losing um, a NATO Ukraine war, I don't think it'll be popular among the Russian people to go to war with Ukraine for a third time. Thank you. Uh, my fourth question to you was this. So, Dr. Glow, you have brought up the topic of Russian po proxies in the east of Ukraine. But have you not considered Western proxy, sorry, um, Ukraine, sorry, Russian proxies, P Putin proxies in the west of Ukraine? For example, the region of Transnistria. Would it not be an incentive for NATO and for Ukraine and for our allies like Moldova to take to wage an offensive war, which would involve the seizing of, of Kremlin proxies like Transnistria, because if such proxies were to fall, does that not give NATO a stronger bargaining chip in the negotiations and further incentivize Vladimir Putin to come to the table or risk losing his 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 friends um yeah um i wouldn't mind um going against russia's proxies i'll be totally fine if moldova tried to take back transnistria i'm fine if ukraine wants to take back donetsk luhansk and crimea um i would even go as far to say i would support georgia taking back south city and abkhazia um in, in a in, in all in an offensive campaign all right so i I, you might not term it this way, but at least I did get one concession. Uh, my fifth mm -hmm. and final question to you, Dr. Globe, is this. Mm -hmm. when we, if, if Russia, if, sorry, if Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin wage an aggressive war in the Ukraine, which they very might do, and we decide, the United States and NATO, not to seize uh, Kaliningrad, which is within our ability... Uh, not to seize the Kamchatka Peninsula, which the United States could can do, not to seize Vladivostok, which the United States could do, do we not further incentivize Vladimir Putin to wage more aggressive campaigns in the future, in particular in the Baltic states, who he is he has been eyeing for years, and do we not also embolden other world bad actors? such as the CCP, to get more in aggressive in Taiwan and incentivize other, other ba bad actors like the Iranians to get more aggressive in the Middle East? Um, I would say no. I would say that um, I, don't, I don't find any use in taking Kaliningrad when we could... Um, do something that's more relevant in the context of this war, which is Crimea Sevastopol, for one. Um, we actually take back territories that are already taken by Russia, already um, regions that Russia has unilaterally annexed and, and actually says is part of the Russian Federation, such as the Republic of Crimea and the autonomous city of Sevastopol. Um, I think we should focus on taking that from Russia, not Kaliningrad. <clears throat> um, all right. So I think that's, um, so what we're going to do now is for the next 15, 20 minutes, give or take, or maybe 30, if you guys want to go at it, um, for the next 20 to 30 minutes, we will have an open discussion. So basically you two can talk however you want. Um, you can discuss whatever you want regarding this topic and I will only intervene if I feel things are getting too heated or there's too much chaos, because if you two are talking over each other, nobody's going to be able to understand what you're saying because they won't be able to uh, apprehend the word. So yeah, 
Uh, open discussion time for the next 30 minutes. Uh, whoever wants to go first can go first. Sure. Uh, so you uh, going back to our point earlier, Dr. Globe, I mean, uh, I think you've already uh, sort of conceded my points about being aggressive and not defensive. I mean, you've already stated that, oh, well, we should take, you know, uh, proxies uh, to the Kremlin, you know, like Transnistria and the regions in the east that have created their autonomous zones and Crimea. I think that you've already conceded to my point, to my art, in some way to my argument. You know, because you're essentially saying, oh, we should fight aggressively there um, and take these regions back. I mean, don't you con don't you at least concede that you're sort of self-defeating your point of remaining on the defensive? Well, if you think about it, um, it kind of I would say it is defensive in the first place for to take out Crimea. Um, this is stolen territory, not recognized to be, be part of Russia by by most of the international community. Um, same with like nobody really uh, recognizes South Ossetia and Abkhazia or Transnistria. These these are stolen territory. Um, you could say there's like a semi um, non um, how would I say nonviolent war in these areas um, because this is this is stealing territory that's rightly there. So I actually argue that an offensive into Crimea is also a defensive. Before you respond to that, Ed Seven, I do want to say to the people watching this. Um, Please submit your questions to the stream chat, uh, and I will get to them um, after this open discussion for the Q and A segment. So, yep, that, that that should be my only interruption so far. Oh, that that that's fine. Um, I I can also just mention to the viewers too. Um, you can go submit questions if you have any to me uh, by going to my Twitch because uh, I am doing the streaming this also via Twitch, and so if you do have a question. You can you can submit it there to me, and you can also donate to my channel uh, via Ko-Fi. There, the link is there. But um, I will not Dr. be able to see those questions though, um, if it's on your Twitch. Okay, then I will I will read them out then if they come up. Okay. Um, uh, so, Doctor, but Doctor Globe, uh, we're talking here about strategies of offensive versus defensive. Um, I think that you're, I think sort of you're kind of going a bit in circles by suggesting that taking Sevastopol and taking Transnistria and Eastern regions and Ukraine that have created autonomous separate zones. I, I think that's, I, th I think that's a counter really to your argument at the end of the day. I mean, don't, I mean, I think that when you talk about what's going on in this conflict and no, none of us really at the end of the day want a war that war is being forced on us uh, by Vladimir Putin and his and his, his kleptocracy. I mean, if we don't, if we simply keep the war localized in the Ukraine and ignore regions like Kaliningrad, I think it's it's not it's not hard to assume that within the Kaliningrad region, which is surrounded by uh, NATO friends and NATO allies and NATO members, uh, it's not it doesn't it's it really seem doesn't seem far fetched to me. For Vladimir Putin to use that as a safe zone for FSB agents to essentially wage their uh, under an underground war among our NATO allies to uh, covertly to try to bring dissension and uh, separation and to use as a pro certainly for propaganda purposes to try and to essentially weaken the alliance from within. When I mean, I'm, when we want to, we should we should be taking that region in order to prevent Vladimir Putin from having a back door? Well, um, who would take Leningrad? I, I actually just want to ask that. Uh, then I'll answer your... Like, our, well, our NATO allies, specifically uh, Poland, I think, Poland would be the best candidate and our Baltic allies. Specifically because Poland, it's, it would be a great choice because Poland themselves, they're very uh, much anti-Kremlin. They don't have the best his history with, uh, you know, <laughs> being under the occupation of, uh, of Moscow, um, not just, you know, <laughs> being essentially a forced uh, puppet and satellite for decades under the, re the tyranny of the, the USSR, and before that being under the tyranny of the Nazi regime. Um, I think the Poles under have a, a greater understanding of freedom and the need for freedom than we do here in the West because they have spent literally generations under dictatorship. 
so how I, I'm just I'm just asking here, like, do you think Russia would actually not fight tooth and nail to defend Kaliningrad? I don't, Vladimir Putin might tell Kaliningrad to fight to the death, but I think that Kaliningrad, surrounded by our NATO friends and allies uh, in the Baltic states and Poland uh, and Germany, if they would stop, you know, putting their foot into both camps, um, which is unfortunate that they, that's what they do. Um, but if there was a united front that took it over, I think that the people the Kaliningrad would say, the Putin diehards at least would say, this isn't worth us dying over. Um, and not only that, those who are in the region who are sympathetic to being free from the Putin dictatorship would welcome us with open arms. And it would be a huge PR victory, in my opinion. Do you think that um, Russia would be willing to exchange Kaliningrad for Crimea? Because Crimea is more strategic. Perhaps not by itself. I think that it puts the, it puts them more in the direction of that. If you take Leningrad, Vladimir Putin might repeat might. This isn't a guarantee. Might decide that losing Kaliningrad is acceptable if he gets the whole of Ukraine. But if we were to take Kaliningrad, Oblast, and take the Kamchatka Peninsula, which we, which the United States could do by itself, and if we were to take Primorsky Krai and eventually seize Vladivostok with our assets in Japan and in Alaska, that then would force Putin, to, Vladimir Putin, to decide, well, either I risk the integrity of the Russian state for, for Ukraine or I risk losing everything. And that would then for, I, I, I sincerely believe that Vladimir Putin as a smart despot and a smart thinking di di dictator and a smart thinking tyrant would understand that he would rather have the, the integrity of Russia state under his rule than risk losing it all by continuing aggressive actions in Ukraine. I think invading Kaliningrad is probably the most realistic thing, but even then, it's, it's, to me, it just sounds a little nuts. However, um, invading Kamchatka, I don't see, like, what's what's the tr strategic value in that? Because if anything, like, you understand that, like, that is very far away from any major Russian economic hub. And, like, other than Vladivostok, like, Russia could still go without Vladivostok. Um, and if we invade from Chukotka, if we invade from Kamchatka, if we um, invade from Primorsky or um, at, like from Magadan or whatever, um, that would take a very long time and take a fuck ton of supply lines and really stretch them out to make it to the other side. Um, and uh, the Western, like the North European, like the reason why Russia feels vulnerable um, on the Western front is because, you know, there's the North European plane. It's really easy for armies to cross over there. Um, from the other front, it's basically just a brick wall. And I don't, I don't know what invading would do over there. Um, I think that'll definitely prolong the war, if anything. Um, if there are no nukes involved, I think Russia would actually kind of be able to kind of... Um, actually turn away from that and actually um, finish off Ukraine and then threaten um, the United States with very with more drastic measures. Like, we don't know how people would respond in an event that we actually invade their territory. Well, the region that you, su you suggested that Vladimir Putin would be willing to lose that, um, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that uh, if then Putin were to lose any significant amount of Russian territory, that would then incentivize him to come to the negotiation table because he cannot risk the integrity of the Russian state and risk losing it. Um, you've talked earlier about how these wars are already unpopular among a sizable contingent in Russia. The Russian, the, the Russian state, 
being uh, invaded, parts of it being taken by NATO forces or NATO allies, it def would definitely make it more unpopular. And with taking a region like, a region like Vladivostok, um, which is the biggest economic center uh, in, in the East and is has got one of the biggest, the only real uh, trading port in the region, you know, at that point, you close off Vladimir Putin's access to the Pacific Ocean. There's there's nothing really else out there that, in terms of a city that has a sizable port like Vladivostok does, to substitute for that. And so I think it's a great, it actually would be a great strategy to employ. And that would, to bring the negotiations to the table. And if we seized it, which I have no doubt that the United States would, we could then also, at least in the east of Russia, support movements that are about uh, democratic reform and about re a real democratic system uh, and a real Republican democracy, not a uh, kleptocracy. You know, and without without being in Russia whatsoever, we have to do it from the outside. And I just don't see that as feasible because without the troops being there without there being some way to get access to these people without uh, fear of being assassinated by the FSB. The fact of the matter is, is that we, we're, we're, we're just hoping. And unfortunately it doesn't always work. Some, you know, like, but, are, but aren't you, but aren't you, but hold on. Aren't you hoping that Vladimir Putin also won't, won't use nukes or that the Russian army um, would start to take command from the president and use nukes if he refuses to do it? Well, having addressed this in my earlier question, the response to your question, uh, the answer is, again, no. Now, you might suggest to me, well, you're not taking into consideration the possibilities. Um, I am taking the possibility into consideration, but I'm telling you that the likelihood is not there at all and is completely unlikely, and the odds of it happening are extremely minimal because... How, how is, how is it unlikely? Like how is it, how is taking Saint Petersburg and invading large swaths of Russian territory not the point where somebody would press the red button? Like I don't I don't get that. Like almost nobody says that because Vladimir Putin is not Kim Jong Un. That's why Kim well, Jong Un yeah, yeah, would not use Kim nukes. Jong -un. Kim but Jong Un, as well, I'm asking your question. Kim Jong Un, as you know, would use nukes because he doesn't care if he rules over ashes. Vladimir Putin is not the same sort of despot or tyrant. He's not mad. He understands that if he uses nukes, the United States will use it, will use them in response. NATO members who have nukes will use them in response. And that will be the end of his kleptocracy uh, completely. And not only that, he will probably not survive the aftermath. That's different from Kim Jong un. Kim Jong un is so mad that he doesn't even take into the possibility that he might die himself if nukes are used. Okay, so, but then I, 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 brought, I brought this up again. Um, I don't think Vladimir Putin would, have, would think he would have anything to lose if the United States invaded Russia, because even if they surrender, well, how would that, how would that look, how would, what would Putin think of himself? Like, there's definitely a, this pride factor in here as well. Um, like, he takes pride in the fact that he's the president of Russia. Um, he wouldn't, I don't think he would just surrender like that. Um, yes, he may not be Kim Jong un, but he don't have to be Kim Jong un to use nukes when there are countries encroaching on your national capital. Not at all, because the, the fact of the matter is, is that if the United the St. Petersburg, Vladivostok, and Kaliningrad aren't even the capitals of the Russian state, you know that's Moscow. But taking these large economic centers, large cities. Well, let's say that, we'll say that Russia refuses to surrender. Let's say that Russia refuses to surrender and we take Vladimir Vostok in St. Petersburg. They're still going. Okay. What do we do? There's no. So you're saying that, well, there's no guarantee that Vladimir Putin will come to the negotiation table if we take their, these regions. Um, I'm telling you very clearly that he has more of an incentive to come to the negotiation table if we take these regions than if we simply. Um, do nothing. Because if Vladimir Putin sees that the West does not have an aggressive response and sees that he can just dictate the terms of the fight in the Ukraine, 
and the Western powers say, Vladimir Putin, we'd like to negotiate a ceasefire and eventual peace. He's under no obli he, he has no incentive to do so whatsoever when all the cards are in his favor. Losing regions like Vladivostok, losing regions like St. Petersburg, losing regions like Kaliningrad would would put would put enormous pressure to force him to come to the negotiation table. There are war hawks in um, Russia, but does that but do they represent the majority of the Russian people who literally have an, have to deal with living in a, a nation where the economy is the size of Italy, but has an incredible has like 10 times or whatever the population i mean i was watching a um watching an interesting show um about an, a british gentleman who travels through russia uh, speaks fluent russian and travels through the country and you know just talks to ordinary russians about their lives and you can say this is hearsay obviously you know you can say whether you accept it or not because it is hearsay but there was a woman talking to him saying oh yeah i I, I can't feed myself with just the pay that I get for my job. I literally have to grow tomatoes and stuff in my backyard because otherwise I would starve. She says, I make it, but I barely make it by. And we've seen how, and we don't even, most Westerners already understand how, just how in dire straits the Russian economy and the Russian nation is. I mean, it's never fully recovered um, from the communist policies uh, of the Soviet Union. And it literally, and that's why there's so there's a joke, you know, essentially about you know Russian women, you know, just wanting to get out of the country, will marry anyone or anything just to get out of there because it's so bad. I think that if you take these regions um, and you wage that fight, you give more of an incentive for the, the 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 Democratic Republicans in Russia to make their move to against the kleptocracy. But if you don't. There's no one's there. There isn't an incentive for them. They have less of an incentive to, to make their move because there's no support okay. beyond that. So Germany during the First World War, Germany thought they could just, you know, they would, they would focus on France. You know, Russia, they're, they're not going to be ready. Um, they didn't think that Nicholas II was going to be competent at all, at all. Right. And they were surprised. They were actually then they were actually realizing they were actually facing a two-front alliance on both sides because they're actually more ready than they thought. Um, if Nicholas II can breach Germany's expectations, um, Vladimir Putin, who is definitely a very smart man, by the way, as you have said, um, he could definitely breach your expectations as well. Um, he is a deceiver. Um, I don't think that we should just um, take ever, um, his greed for granted, that he will just always act the same in every scenario. If somebody is literally invading their country is actually existential threat to his own interest, and he would go down either way, if he surrendered or not, he would be willing. I think he would be willing to take the world down with him. He's not Kim Jong-un, but here's the thing with Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un is willing to do a, a, a other bunch of fat crazy shit. Um, he would probably be willing to launch three nukes on South Korea at once. Um, he probably, um, he, he executes his own uncle. He uh, was probably, he would maybe launch an offensive if he really could. Um, Putin is definitely more strategic. He's not as reckless. Um, he's definitely better at diplomacy. Um, but that doesn't mean, just because he's not Kim Jong-un, just because he's not trigger happy, doesn't mean he's not going to, re to resort to the most drastic measures in the case that Moscow is getting encroached upon by forces that have invaded Russia. Not true, because the fact of the matter is... I, I hate to interrupt, but um, I'm just going to say that uh, you, I will give you guys about another five, six minutes of this open discussion before we get into the Q&A. All right, could, sorry for interrupting. No, that's fine. Um, I've just picked up a copy of... Putin's Wars um, by Marcel H. Van Herpen, um, The Rise of Russia's Imperialism. Um, if you examine contents, you will see that Vladimir Putin, yes, acts in a in a despotic, but a, a very in, but a but a pretty intelligent manner. Um, you've you've already, you've conceded that Dr. Globe that he's not a fool um, or a madman on the lines of 
Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un is a madman who maintains his power strictly through the use of force and terror. Vladimir Putin maintains his power um, through the use, the suggested use of force, um, through, for example, the assassination of dissidents, um, as we've seen what happened in the UK, in which there were several critics of Putin who were uh, Russian nationals that were lured to um, meetings with individuals they who were Russian that they thought were friendly to them, um, and had their t uh, were given tea that was uh, radioactive, and they consumed it, and as a result, they suffered horrendous deaths and died. Um, Vladimir Putin exists off that, you know, certain that threat of, well, if you come out against me, something might happen to you that's bad. Um, he doesn't so that use won't apply to the United States and Russian territory. He doesn't use the, he doesn't use the same collective punishment that um, Kim Jong Un does, but that also. But again, the the fact of the matter is is that Vladimir Putin also in, uh, is described here as rational and that he gets what he can get, but he's not willing to go that far in terms of using a nuke. And that's my that's my analysis of so far what I'm reading. Because Vladimir Putin understands very clearly as an intelligent actor that if he goes down and he takes the world with and he takes the world with him, he takes Russia with him, that he will not survive the aftermath. And dictators and despots on the level of Vladimir Putin want to survive. They do not go to the, that extreme. And even the Soviet Union, when um, it was collapsing and the communists temporarily seized back control of the government, they even themselves did not consider the nuclear option to maintain their power, even though their whole system was falling around about them, because they understood that if they did use that option, because that's when the military diehards, the communists, took power um, and seized the government temporarily. They okay, would have destroyed so everything. They, they they would have been destroyed and obliterated. Two, two more minutes. Okay, so here's what I don't get. Like you said that you've thought about the chances that Russia will launch nukes. I but you haven't really really reached a very substantive conclusion on why Putin would never launch nukes because again. Um, there is no precedent of the United States invading Russia of a significant of a significantly threatening nation that is um, totally thre threatening to Russia, Russia's existence invading Russia. Um, it's not it's like like Putin may run for the hills if Ukraine actually um, you know has a bigger fight than expected. Same with Georgia. Um, same with if he pro maybe tries to invade Estonia. Maybe if we take Crimea. But the prospect of us taking St. Petersburg and marching toward Moscow, you understand that there is a much different, a very different ball game that we are talking about. This this isn't this this like this isn't like invading Ukraine is softball in comparison. And like again, um if um if Putin like if 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 the United States starts advancing into Russian territory, they take economic centers, that's already a big humiliation for Putin. All right. And Putin already has low self-esteem. He's literally said before, there's no happiness in life. And pretty much the only self-esteem that he clings on to is the Prussian presidency. He may be smart, but if it comes to the point that his country and himself will go down, he could possibly lose his sanity because that's definitely possible and take the world down with him. Because here's the thing, we haven't seen Putin when it's like when he's under intense pressure that um, there are superpowers literally encircling Moscow. That's a whole entire different scenario from being kicked out of Ukraine or being kicked out of Georgia. Now you're going to get the I'm last word because we're going to go to Q. We're, we're going to go to Q and A. So you get the last word before we go in the Q and A net. All right. So we're supposed to have this then imagine. We're supposed to have this imaginary idea that uh, if we take. Kaliningrad, if we take Kamchatka, uh, if we take Vladivostok, and we take St. Petersburg, um, all of a sudden, then all bets are off. No. Uh, these regions, again, taking them would threaten the integrity of Russia and would give us 
areas in which we could support real uh, democratic Republicans within Russia who want to see a change, want to be rid of the kleptocracy in which they all suffer from. And at the same time, not ha not do this this risk of what you describe as the all bets are off option, because even if they, even if that was considered, and I dispute that that would even be an option considered by Vladimir Putin, taking these areas, which are very which are very far away from Moscow, the closest one being Saint Petersburg, which is literally hundreds of miles away, would still not put Vladimir Putin or the diehards in a situation where even nukes would be considered. Again, I'm taught these taking these regions gives the West more flexibility to force Vladimir Putin to the negotiation table and at the same time give the West the ability to potentially get a Republican uh, democracy in Russia that will actually think about making building up an economy that will take care of the Russian people rather than just um, fulfilling the territorial ambitions of one man and his klepto kleptocrats who keep him in power. All right. I think that's, I think we'll stop it there. We're going to go to the Q and a now. Um, so, um, so first of all, Matt, uh, you actually have someone who seems to be largely in agreement with you. Uh, now the Fox who is in the stream chat, um, she says, uh, giving into Putin is no different than appeasing Hitler. Putin wants to regain the former USSR's borders. Well, I, I, t I totally agree with, you know, that position. Um, you know, Vladimir Putin um, is a despot, you know, certainly. Um, he's maniacal. He's a, a murderer. You know, um, Alexander uh, Litv Litvinenko, um, is one of the many victims of Vladimir Putin and his attempts to maintain his control over the Russian state. He is a kleptocrat. Um, Russia is largely essential. The Russian state essentially today is nothing more than a, a series of oligarchs who are very wealthy and very rich, um, who use Putin as a way to maintain and control their power. And Putin uses them to maintain his power so he can fulfill his territorial ambitions of the Russian state. You know, he's he's absolutely uh, a terrible person. He's you know, he's he may not be as evil as uh, Hitler or Stalin were, uh, but he certainly is a, a certainly re reprehensible character. OK, uh, this question is actually for Globe uh, to duck from now um, to Dr. Globe. What of our ABM defenses? We are entirely capable of shooting down. Uh, their missiles or their nukes more specifically. And before you answer that, um, uh, Globe, uh, she also mentioned earlier about, part of my butchered pronunciation, uh, THAAD, GDM, Patriot missiles. Um, it seems she, she seems to suggest that if even if nukes did get involved, it wouldn't be that big of a deal because we would be able, with our superior technology, to essentially shoot down all the nukes. How, how would you respond? Well, actually, um, actually, as of December 2021, um, recently they've introduced the new S-550 air defense system. It puts the United States years behind. They are, it, it can shoot um, down some of our military craft as high as um, in low orbit, some of our lower satellites in space. They can shoot that high, and those are going to be used by the Russian military as soon as 2025. And then, you know, consider on top of this, when they have a more, um, when they have a more advanced missile defense system now, plus when they have more nukes than us at the same time, well, you think that's not going to start giving them some leverage? Ned, you can respond. Well, I, I don't know uh, well, I because I've, I've heard different things on what U.S. capacities are in terms of uh, stopping nukes. Um, you know, this this is not this person is not this person who um, I'm drawing from can't isn't really isn't really an expert per se. Like they have like they like they have a Ph.D. or something like that. They're more of like a just sort of an avid uh, war historian and such like that. Um, so you can take what I say with a grain of salt, obviously, um, 
because it's better to you because I, I prefer to use you know real experts you know uh who you know in the fields compared to just you know diy sort of people not that diy people don't have it right sometimes or and you know again i don't know you don't know they're maybe they've read like a thousand books on the subject you know and they they're brilliant you know i mean i've heard it said that you know if you read um one book a month for five years straight in one particular area you'll become one of the top 10 percent experts in that field um but i have heard it said different things i've heard people say that you know we have we have the capabilities to shoot down their nukes if they launch them um, I've heard people say, like, you know, Bing Cobb's Battlegrounds, you know, say that the United States could, um, let, against China's nukes, who, and then they have around 300, could at best, you know, shoot down only 30 of them. So I, I don't really know what the capabilities are out there, because there's so many people who are making different opinions on this. I would say this, though, it is incumbent upon the United States to really work on its missile defense, because um, in one day and age... Um, it was the cavalry who was the that that was the weapon of war, you know, with the with the bow and arrow. You know, the Huns uh, conquered half the world, no, the, no, the world at the time, you know, with um, just being on horseback and with the bow and arrow. Then there was another time in which the carrier uh, was supreme in the sea. You know, um, World War II, in which the United States lost um, almost all of its battleships in uh, the Battle of Pearl Harbor. And in which the battleship We're was seen as the, uh, the closing of this question. Sorry, in which the battleship was seen as the premier weapon of war in the sea, the carrier actually showed that it was actually superior and supplanted the battleship uh, at the time. Um, nowadays, it's missiles that everyone is getting into because you know you can shoot your enemy from afar and not have to be at risk. You know, like the drones, for example, the drones were the beginning of that. So I would say this, it's incumbent upon the United States and NATO to really work on its missile defense to deter potential nuclear strikes. Okay, this one's for Net. To Net, why do you want to use a large land invasion we don't have enough troops for? Hold on, let me reread. Let me reread. To Net, why do you want to use a large land invasion when we don't have enough troops for when American opinion would largely be against the war? Well, the second is disputed. That's an opinion, and that's uh, polls say different things. I know that most polls today say that you know Americans want to do something about Ukraine. You know, most Americans are in favor, according to most polls, of giving weapons uh, and you know satellite aid and other form of forms of aid to Ukraine, but they're not necessarily in favor of, at least according to most polls actually being military involved in the Ukraine. But the fact of the matter is, is that we do have, we have one of the strongest militaries in the world, and we do. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that people say, oh, well, look at Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a withdrawal from political elites who decided to placate the needs of isolationists and placate the fifth columns and placate non-interventionists paleocon jobs and regressive progressives who had been calling for years and, and lobotarians who had been calling for years to withdraw despite the fact that there was despite the fact that all the real experts uh in the especially in the military brass were telling uh the president don't do this they're not ready yet give it a few more years and we'll probably have them ready but we're telling you right now that if you leave now and you give the 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 afghan government no um, guarantees of using the air force to drive back the Taliban. They will cr they will crumble, and if it crumbled even faster than they even predicted. They said six months. It happened like probably less than six weeks. And the fact of the matter is, is that um, the mil United States military didn't lose that fight to the Taliban military. It was the political elites who lost that. If the American public and the American government are in tune with the idea of winning a war against Vladimir Putin, that it will be done. We have the strongest military in the world. China is trying to catch up. Russia is trying to catch up. But there are many arguments that that you know highlight you know the fact that Russia's economy is so bad they really can't get their military up to where they want. You know, it's more of a paper tiger if anything else. Doctor Globe, you can respond. Yeah. Um, 
I don't really, I, I, I don't, here's the thing. When you invade Russia, they have the most nukes, like, ever. They don't have those for no reason. They have them for defensive purposes. Um, if the United States tried to invade Russia, even before the nukes started to come, um, they do have their air defense systems. They will shoot down a lot of our planes. Many of our military members will die in this war. Um, Russia has enough. Russia has enough military capacity to damage us badly if Russia holds off on this, um, even without the nukes. Um, like this, like it would it would be damaging. I don't even think we would even have a net gain from this. If anything, China would be. Um, totally happy with us going to war with each other when the two other superpowers are just punching each other in the face. Well, they can just do whatever they want to do. They can just take Taiwan. They just keep making more deals. Um, and, you know, we're not going to have time to threaten China. Don't take Taiwan or we're going to fight you. It's like, oh, yeah, how are you going to fight us when all of your fucking troops are trying to cross Siberia? Or are try or in St. Petersburg and trying to completely sandwich Moscow, which by the way, um, could possibly end up in a nuclear war. I, I'm just going to keep repeating that because I think anybody would kind of agree that that would that's there's a high chance of nuclear war in that regard. It's um, I can't even imagine how Russia would not even respond with nukes with that. Just because Vladimir Putin's just a certain way doesn't mean he's not um, <laughs> he's not he's not going to act differently in a certain circumstance when he's literally being caved in and he might lose everything that he had. Like there's no, there's, there'll be no worth living there anymore. Not, not to mention that he wouldn't have many years, much less of his life left. Like he has less years than he has. Um, he's lived more years than he has left. He's around like 60 years old, 70 years old. He's really doesn't have a lot to fight for if he's going to lose all of his dignity in the presidency. Um, Dr. Gold, uh, may I ask you a quick question then? Mm -hmm. um, I forgot which war it was, but um, India and Pakistan did go to war with each other, and they're both nuclear powers. So there is a chance that there can be a conventional war between two nuclear powers without it necessarily escalating to nuclear war, right? So usually, like, if I'm not mistaken, it was confined to Bangladesh, right? And... Uh... No, I think this was in the 90s. Let me look it up. The 90s. No, my my mistake. Uh keep, um I will look that I'll I'll look that up in the meantime. Like Pakistan Pakistan like wasn't a nuclear power until like the the Cargill uh, like war. That's uh, the Cargill war. That was in yeah, that was in 1999. Yep, I was right. It was in the 90s. Uh, the cargo so war. That was a war between Pakistan and India. They were both nuclear powers at the time. And okay, it where was it located? Where was it confined to? It was fought between India and Pakistan from May to July in the Kargil district of Jammu and Kashmir, somewhere along the the long the. Uh, okay, line. so but this isn't but this isn't like a full scale Indian invasion of Pakistan, nor is it vice versa. This is a much different scenario. Um, India is not taking, um, isn't taking Karachi. Um, Pakistan isn't taking um, Lundhiana. Like, this is this is a different scenario that Net7 is proposing. Uh, Net7, you can reply, but there's a few more, there's like four more questions I need to get to. Go to the questions. I'd rather the audience get their say. Okay. Uh, pessimistic Titan says to Net Seven, "What about the logistics of, of a Siberian invasion? The supply lines would be stretched across hundreds of kilometers across uh, frozen tundra." You're muted. So Siberia so, is. So, um, it it's it's much it's very vast. It encompasses uh, hundreds of miles of territory, uh, you know, stretching extremely far, you know, all the way to the Urals, 
um, all the way down to the east, uh, Otox, Otox Sea. Um, what I am suggesting is that the United States should seize um, the very east, the, the eastern parts of Siberia. Um, like I've mentioned before, you know, uh, seizing Vladivostok. That's a part of Siberia. You know, I've talked about the Kamchatka Peninsula. Uh, that is a part of S Siberia. Uh, did, am I suggesting that we go all the way to the Karst Sea or to the Leptava Sea or all the way to Lake Baikal? I haven't suggested that. I have suggested that seizing a decent amount of a territory in the east, like Vladivostok um, and its surrounding uh, region, um, Primorsky Krai, the Kamchatka Peninsula, and perhaps other territories in that area would be suitable to showing Vladimir Putin that the West is not going to back down. The West is going to defend its allies and its friends. And that Vladimir Putin had better come to the negotiating table or risk losing it all. And by seizing those, ter those Eastern territories that I've mentioned, it gives us the ability to support and help people within those regions who are sick of the kleptocracy and want to see a change. And without being there, they won't be able to. Dr. Globe's idea is we want to see Vladimir Putin uh, removed by the people within. And I grant and I and I agree with that position. But that's not going to happen unless we give an opportunity for those people. Um, I, I hearken back to the example of the first Gulf War, the first Iraq War in which we assumed wrongly that because we had so devastatingly chased, uh, defeated and chased back um, you know, the Ba'athist regime to its borders, that it would collapse on its own. We saw that they simply regrouped, reorganized, and then went on a killing spree. All right, for the sake of time, try to keep your response, uh, your response to the questions within one uh, one minute time frame, uh, just for the sake of time. So, uh, Dr. Globe, you can respond to the next seven before I go to the next question. Okay, I'm trying to re I'm trying to recollect. Uh, what were we just what, okay, okay. Um, so you don't even support going all the way across Siberia, and so. Um, then on the other fronts, it'll be really hard to get past the Ural Mountains, let alone all of the urban centers. Um, so in that case, um, Putin could just uh, relocate to Sverdlovsk. He could re relocate to Krasnoyarsk, continue fighting from there. Um, he may just fight himself to the death. Um, we don't know. I don't know why. Like, I'm just going to say, yes, like what you're, what you're making is an assumption. I haven't really heard any convincing arguments as to why he wouldn't take aggressive measures to defend his spot. Um, because um, here's the thing, when you're pushed out of Ukraine, maybe if you even take clinic lateral blast, I'll probably give you the benefit of the doubt on that. He, 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 he might let that, let that go by. He might let that fly by, you know, that doesn't really threaten his chair. Um, but if you, invade Russia itself and threaten Moscow. That's a different story. Okay, next question. What will Net7 do that's different in strategy than Napoleon and Hitler and their ambition to control Russia? So basically this question at 7 I think is um, they're, they're trying to argue that if the U.S. invaded Russia, it would be a failure just like when Germany and France tried to invade Russia. Well, certainly. Um, they're, they're not comparable. It's, it's sort of like the, the, the sort of the, 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 the meme that people say that Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. It's this idea that, oh, if you step foot in there, you're done. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's such an, a naive thinking of the world and that every situation or everything past applies to the here and now. Um, there's for one, um, I'll let's use the example. Let's see. Let's, I'll just say, oh, sorry. I forgot. We only have one minute. Um, I have to summarize real quickly. Um, it's not the same NATO, the United States all together. We have numerous partners, the Baltic States that can take territories next to them. Finland can seize, uh, St. Petersburg. The United States can seize Kamchatka and, um, 
uh, Vladivostok. Ukraine can seize territories bordering it. So it's not simply one person doing everything, multiple partners taking different bites to in order to achieve the ultimate goal. Thank you. Uh, Globe, you can respond, and then I'm going to go to the next question. Oh, um, I yeah, you just go to the next question. Okay, coming right up uh, to Net7, why do you have an obses obsession over the Kamchatka? There is no strategic reason for it, nor any resources. Uh, so, Net, um, I think he's asking, what is the strategic significance of Kamchatka? So Kanchaka has about has hundreds of thousand people, hundreds of thousand people who live in the region. Um, it has a, 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 a at least a decent population. Uh, it's a very large landmass, um, and the Russians uh, don't have. It's a population in which the United States would not be able to would be able to uh, occupy and liberate, um, but at the same time, not at the risk of so many Russian soldiers being there as to make it a, a, a big fight. Um, it gives us a springboard from there, which to then take other territories in, or regions in the east of Russia and definitely would help us in terms of supporting uh, a campaign uh, besides our assets in Japan in taking Vladivostok. So that's why, because it's a stepping stone to, to further um, campaigns, now regional campaigns, uh, I'm not suggesting beeline all the way to Moscow. What I am saying is take these regions that are within our sphere that are somewhat isolated, and... but that can be used as leverage. Okay. Uh, Dr. Globe, your response? Well, if we took those regions from them, they'll definitely seek to be more aggressive once they regrouped after that. I think like just the idea of Ukraine joining NATO alone prompted them take Crimea. Um, I don't think Russia would just let that slide by. Um, it would definitely would definitely have become more hyper competitive. And another thing I'll say is that um, Vladimir Putin is already unpopular as he is. And I don't think um, when Vladimir Putin is kind of like nearing the end of his life, okay, he doesn't have many years left on him. We don't even know what's going to happen with what's going to happen with Russia after he goes, like everything is unpredictable at this point. Um, but we shouldn't act like he's going to be this eternal God who's going to eternally challenge us. I think if he even tries one more war in Ukraine and loses, I think that's that's enough of what he's going to have. I think he's going to try to consolidate power back at home um, because he'll have to, again, regain uh, morale within his own country. And time. Okay. Um Coming in from now, the Fox to Dr. Globe, the USSR and China went to war with the, with the, with one another, uh, full blown war. I, I think this was in response to the whole two nuclear powers can indeed go to war with each other. Full blown. War. Okay. So that was a border war and it didn't really reach very far. Uh, it's kind of similar to what happened between India and Pakistan. Um, it wasn't, it didn't get to the point where, um, one other posed a threat to the extent that one used a nuclear bomb. And it's in the same way it could be comparable to if um, Russia um, invades parts of Ukraine, we pushed them out. That doesn't mean that we need to invade Russia full scale. Kind of that same um, harshness. Oh, um, Net7, you can respond to that if you wish. Well, I think that the, the Fox makes a good point, you know. And I just want to say that uh, I'm a big fan of Foxes, you know, being Star Fox. I grew up on that video game, and I still rank it as my the, the my most favorite game of all time, just because of the effects it had on me as a kid. And I, <laughs> but um, I, I think that Fox makes an excellent point. You know, nation states can go to war, even full scale war, without the nuclear option. It's it's just the assumption because we have those, you know, fears of the cold of you know of the Cold War past coming up but historically we've seen that even partners who hate each other's gut people who hate each other's guts like the indians and the pakistanis i mean i once had an indian gentleman say to me that you know we hate each other more than the palestinians and the israelis do um still even then the nuclear option is not considered because each side knows 
um, what is going to happen if okay. one side does it. So hold on, hold on. But what if, let's say. No, 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 no. Okay. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Yeah. Dr. Globe, you can, you can, uh, closing statement and you're going to be the first to give your closing statement okay. you can respond the previous points you weren't able to address so w save it for your closing um we're going to go to the next question and i'm not sure who it's addressed to um dragon asks what will we do about the s 400s i'm not sure who this is for anybody want to take that on um well i'm assuming he's talking them, about we just innovate <laughs> Um, work on missile defense, you know, nowadays, um, you know, hostile actors like, you know, the CCP are really banking on using missiles as weapons, you know, uh, and missile attacks. So it's up to the United States to make a counter to that. Okay, Globe, you can respond. I agree, kind of. Um, it's pretty, it's a pretty simple answer. All right. And the last question, and I think this is for both of you. Uh, Paul's question is, does NATO not bear any responsibility for increasing tensions through its eastward expansion? Wait, sorry. Wait, sorry. Let me read that. Does NATO not bear any responsibility for increasing tent? Um, yeah, I think it's completely on Russia's fault. Um, the only thing that NATO ever did was say, like, sure, Ukraine, you can join NATO. That's it. <laughs> yeah, we have so. to understand that NATO is not trying to expand in the East um, for territorial purposes. Okay, NATO is not a nation state. It's an organization. It's a collection of nations that has been the most successful alliance since uh, the end of World War II, in which was formed um, strictly to combat communism and uh, the USSR. And now, and even as continue today, because it's about uh, it's a strong natural alliance. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that Vladimir Putin as uh, Russia uh, could come into the Western sphere, you know, stop, you know, making fraudulent elections, stop killing, uh, stop murdering slash assassinating dissidents, stop attacking your neighbors when they don't make decisions that you don't like. You know, um, I think it's incumbent upon the Russian people to, you know, get a change in leadership. And it's up to the Western world to not do what we did in the 90s, which was to see that Russia was leaving communism and going on a democratic path, but do nothing. You know, the, the West really missed out big in the 90s to really bring Russia into the democratic sphere. Um, and unfortunately, we're living with the ramifications of that. But that's not on NATO. That's that's more on um, that's more on America's uh, failure to do something in the 90s. And yeah. that's more on, Ru on Putin's aggressive actions today within the last 15 to 10 years. Okay. Um, and I do want to say before we go in the closing statements, um, when these people out, when these people complain about eastward expansion, NATO eastward expansion, do they never ask? Why do they well, never ask? I got, I got four minutes left. Yeah, yeah. Why do they never ask themselves? Gee, why do these former Soviet countries want to join a military alliance designed to counter Russian aggression? Hmm. Anyway, uh, we're going to go in the closing statements. Uh, Dr. Globe really has to go. So, Dr. Globe, the floor is yours with your five-minute uh, closing statement. Okay. So here's the reason why I wanted to explain earlier that the Sino-Soviet War and the Indo-Pakistani War are not viable comparisons because these... They may have been fought by large-scale militaries in full-scale combat, but it didn't really. It didn't really. Um, the border that the um, I would say that the military. Um, uh, it, what's the word? I can't advancements. Um, never really pose a significant threat to the other's um, existence, right? Um, let's say that if India manages to make it to Karachi, advance toward Islamabad. If um, Pakistan takes Ahmedabad and then advances toward New Delhi, I think that'll be a much different st story. Similar to if Russia went down through Heilongjiang and went toward Beijing, or, you know, like that's like, remember these were just border conflicts that didn't really go very, but they didn't go very far from where the original border was in the first place. So I don't think those are viable comparisons. What Netsam is proposing here is that we go into Kamchatka, that we go into St. Petersburg and take their most valuable, like, take the most, if I, one, one of their most valuable economic centers, if not their most valuable city, St. Petersburg. Like, that's where they have uh, access to the Baltic Sea and the European market. 
Um, I can't imagine that Russia would not react to this in a very, very harsh way. And um, I guess I'll end it there because I got two minutes left in the library. All right, and you can you can leave now if you must. Uh, okay. But net seven, you will have five. You have your five minute closing statement. Uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I also do want to thank my opponent, Doctor Globe, for uh, taking up this debate with me. I've certainly enjoyed the back and forth between them. Um, it's been very cordial, and I appreciate that. Um, to the audience here, I'm, I will address you now. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're faced with uh, an autocrat, um, a despot, a tyrant, um, a man who wants to force uh, um, former Soviet bloc nations uh, back into the sphere of influence, back into his control, uh, back into this, uh, the, the, the control of essentially what, what some would suggest is the Soviet Union uh, reborn just under a different name. Um, you know, people make jokes often about the FSB that, you know, what's the difference between them and the KGB? Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, our friend and our ally, Ukraine, um, is asking for our help. And we, we need to have a strategy in which is actually going to help them. A strategy that is actually going uh, to force Vladimir Putin to back off and to force a change uh, within um, Russia. So how do we do that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, one of those strategies is take a Leningrad. It is surrounded by uh, friendly NATO nations in the Baltics. Take St. Petersburg. It is the gateway for uh, Russia to access the Baltic Sea and to access um, sea trade to the uh, markets, the European market. Take Vladivostok. It is the entrance for um, Russia uh, into the Pacific Ocean and to get the trade from East Asia. There is no other port in East Asia that matches whatsoever uh, Vladivostok's capabilities. Uh, take um, parts of the Russian Far East, you know, which would get which would allow us to support. Um, real democratic Republicans in the country that want to see the kleptocracy gone and want freedom, who we can now support. And now f and take and by taking these regions, not going so far, you know, but like spreading it out, the responsibility, the Finns, um, and uh, taking St. Petersburg, uh, the Baltic states and Poland taking Kaliningrad, and the Ukrainians um, seizing uh, back the eastern part of their nation and maybe some other Russian territory. And Moldova taking Transnistria, and the United States focusing on Vladivostok and uh, the Russian Far East by spreading out the responsibility and taking these other nation, these parts of the nation, we all then are able to to counter Putin's aggression and force him to the negotiation table, in which no longer a will he be able to wage aggressive war, but also we bring about a huge possibility of a chance of democratic reforms without risking what Dr. Globe talks about. And I, I and we've already dispute we've already shown that it's not that states can go to war without throwing the nuclear option. And it's 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 overhyped, it's over exaggerated. Uh, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much everyone for listening in. All right, wonderful. So um yeah I think that's um that's really about it. Um thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'm, I'm going to be hosting a, a panel tomorrow. It's going to be a 2v2 debate on the death penalty. And a man known as Suz uh, Suzuki, uh, someone that Seven knows very well, will be joining us on that panel. So uh, looking forward to it. Uh, I hope to see you all there uh, as well. And uh, have a splendid night, everyone. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it.